Well, hello, everyone. Greetings. On behalf of the Benzie Area Historical Society and Board of Directors, volunteers, welcome to the Benzonia Academy Lecture Series. My name is Larry White. I'm filling in for Barb Mort today. I am the Vice President and Chair of the Historical Society's Archives Committee, and I'll be your host today. For those who don't know, the Benzoni Academy was established in 1863 by community founders with a goal to afford all people, regardless of race or sex, the opportunity to receive a liberal education. The Historical Society seeks to carry on this tradition by offering these free series of lectures on the second Thursday of each month. Topics cover local, national, and international history. Please note that our lectures are being recorded and um, they're also available then can be viewed um, at any time on our YouTube channel. Um, you can find links to these recordings on, on our website at www.benzymuseum.org. Before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to mention that our next Academy lecture will be on Thursday, March 10th at 4 p.m. Our presenter, Andy Bollender, will be discussing the topic of maritime safety. Andy is a wonderful presenter, so mark your calendars. Now I'm pleased to introduce today's presenter, Tim Foster. Tim is a maritime history enthusiast and his family has been part of Benzie County uh, back to 1927. He is a member of the board of directors of the Society for the Preservation of the SS Mil City of Milwaukee and on the board of the Benzie Area Historical Society. Tim also serves on our programs, events, and community outreach committee. In case you're not aware, our museum has an excellent Ann Arbor railroad and car ferry exhibit featuring full, or excuse me, featuring scale model replicas of Ann Arbor ferries. These model ships were handcrafted from scratch <coughs> by Tim, and they are well worth seeing if you have not visited our museum recently. Before we begin, please note that we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization that relies on donations from people like you to support our programs. If you enjoy this lecture series, please consider supporting us with a tax deductible donation. It's easy to donate. Again, www.benzymuseum.org. Finally, a general reminder again to mute your microphone during the presentation. And I note that Zoom chat will be available during the presentation. So please post your questions there. We'll try to do a Q&A session after Tim has completed his presentation. Uh, but again, we'll try to wrap up as close to five o'clock as possible. And now without further ado, I would like to introduce Tim Foster. Thanks, Larry. Uh, you have to let me share my screen here. I think you're the host now, so you're good to go. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, well, my name is uh, Tim Foster, like he said. Thanks, Larry, again. Uh, I'm coming to you today from uh, my workshop and studio at the historic uh, Charles Robertson House here in Frankfurt. Uh, the house was built in 1900 by Charles Robertson, who was an early captain for the Ann Arbor Car Ferries. Uh, he lived here from 1900 to 1918 when he moved to Ludington and became a prominent captain with the Pier Marquette Car Ferries. His son, uh, Bunny Robertson, was born into this house in 1905. And he became uh, the first captain of the SS Badger in 1953. Uh, the family has a long maritime history here in Frankfurt and uh, also in Ludington. 
And I have been able to stay connected with uh, some of Charlie's relatives uh, through the city of Milwaukee. And uh, they have helped me uh, identify some of the things in the house and also where they lived in other places in Frankfurt. It's been very interesting. And uh, uh, undoubtedly, uh, Charlie Robertson dealt with some of the problems that we're going to discuss here today as a captain for both the Ann Arbor and the Pier Marquette car ferries. Uh, he passed away in 1944. Uh, but he uh, was a master on several ships and brought out at least four ships on their maiden voyages. So he was a very highly regarded uh, captain on the Great Lakes. So we're gonna start uh, in 1929 and then we're gonna work our way backwards a little bit. So to start here, uh, in uh, October of 1929, a message case was found bobbing in the lake off of St. Joseph, Michigan. And uh, the message, which still survives today in the archives in Chicago, uh, reads as follows. <clears throat> SS Milwaukee, October 22nd, 1929, 8.30 p.m. The ship is taking water fast. We have turned around and headed for Milwaukee. Pumps are working, but Seagate is bent in and can't keep the water out. Flicker is flooded. Seas are tremendous. Things look bad. Crew roll is about the same as on the last payday. Signed, A.R. Saden, Purser. So, <clears throat> the car ferry Milwaukee uh, sank with all hands on October 22nd, 1929 only three miles off the Wisconsin shore and about 15 minutes outside of Milwaukee Harbor. Uh, and uh, she took her whole crew with her. Uh, it's, the wreck was discovered in 1972. And even today is one of the most uh, uh, visited shipwrecks on the Great Lakes. She lies in about 100 feet of water. And uh, it was a very uh, tragic thing that could have been avoided and shouldn't have happened, uh, but it just demonstrates the type of uh, uh, dangers that uh, these car ferry people had for almost the better part of a century sailing back and forth across Lake Michigan. There were 31 car ferries built across the Great Lakes from 1892 to 1953. Three of these car ferries sank. Uh, two of them sank with all hands. And uh, the chronic issue that these boats had was that they had an open stern, which we're going to start our program with. Now, the first picture that you see here was taken on October 24th, 1929. And this is the ferry Pier Marquette 17 uh, on her way back from Milwaukee to Ludington two days after the Milwaukee sank with all hands. And you can see the severity of the seas that she's trying to uh, work against on her way back from Lunnington. And really what, she is, uh, what this is, is this is the old sea from that storm. And you can still uh, see that the, the waves are, are still topping the pilot house. The, Mil uh, the Pier Marquette 17 was in Milwaukee when uh, the Milwaukee left port, and she sat it up. She sat the storm out in the slip, which was right across the Kinnikinnick River from the Grand Trunk Line. So, so how did this happen? I mean, when car ferries were first built in 1892, the Ann Arbor Railroad here in Frankfurt started the service. Now, uh, carrying freight cars on a boat was not really a new idea. Uh, but what the Ann Arbor was doing was a new concept. Going across Lake Michigan was much different than some of these other boats had. And so this boat, starting with the Ann Arbor number one and two, was a kind of a revolutionary design. They had never tried this before. So you had a boat with a wide open stern with four tracks on a flat deck uh, to carry the, these freight cars across the lake. 
Now this drawing is one of the builders drawings from the Ann Arbor one, Ann Arbor number one that was done by Craig Shipbuilding in Toledo, Ohio. They built the first two car ferries. And what's interesting about this is you can see that, that the stern is closed off by some kind of a cover that appears to be raised and lowered by chains. And you can see the chains here on either side of this frame that has been uh, built on to the stern of the boat. You can see the four tracks here with four strings of freight cards here. Um, but what's curious about this is that even though they recognize the problem that the open stern would cause by sailing out into Lake Michigan, the boat was built with the structure not in place. So she came out with an open stern. Now the open stern presents a problem with these flat deck car ferries uh, because they have numerous openings on the car deck that lead down to the bottom of the ship. Uh, there are hatches to drop coal in to fuel the boat. There are hatches over the engines so you can access the engines. Uh, there are stairways down to the cruise quarters down under the car deck where the uh, engine room crew had their quarters. There's a stairway not too far from the stern that goes down into this compartment. Uh, and also there are a number of scuttles on the car deck. All these openings could allow water to get into the bottom of the boat if the water made it far enough up onto the car deck and if the hatches were not properly sealed. Now, later on, the, the plans that you see here are from the city of Milwaukee, okay? And there were six ferries built almost identical to the same plan. By the time these boats came out in the mid 1920s, these hatches were heavy steel hatches that could be secured to the car deck and were basically made watertight. And they also, had, they also were built with sea gates. Back in 1892, these hatches were really no more than like wooden grates over the deck that were unsealed, that were unfastened, uh, and uh, basically they were unsafe. And uh, this is the type of thing that could let water into the top, into the bottom of the boat. And they could go into the boiler room, into the engine room. Uh, the water raises up in the boiler rooms to the level of the fireboxes and the boilers. And if it gets high enough, <clears throat> it could put out the fires and then you lose steam pressure. And so you have no power to the boat itself. So what the builders did was they basically told the captains that you have to keep the bow of the boat into the weather. And uh, the captains were entrusted to do this, to keep the bow of the boat into the weather uh, and tack across the lake if they needed to. Uh, the problem there is that many of these ferries weren't powerful enough to make it into the seas if the seas were big enough. There are many documented stories of these car ferries in 20 foot waves being driven backward into the, into the seas and water would just come up right over the stern and flood the car deck uh, and, and make its way down into the holds below. So it was, an, it was a dangerous situation and uh, the early days of the car ferries had uh, a lot of trouble with, with this, uh, situation that they were dealing with. Now here, this is in Frankfurt, probably about 1903 or so, 1904. The boat here is the Ann Arbor number two, one of the original ferries. And you could see her wide open stern here, which is already, it's been cut back 50 feet because they had clearance issues with getting the freight cars on board through the open sterns. So they, they cut the stern back 50 feet uh, to allow better clearance. And you can see her freight here is loaded all the way to the stern, which brings the stern of the boat down lower into the seas. Now, on heavy loads like this, the distance between the car deck and sea level is about four feet, four to five feet. It's not much taller than an, you know, a man at the, at the highest point. Um, so it doesn't take much wave action to start washing over the car deck. 
and and also during the winter time the the stern of the boat would ice up and the ice would add weight to the stern and drag the stern down even further once the idea caught on that it was going to succeed with these car ferries uh, the competition between Great Lakes lines became uh, very heated, very fast. In between 1892 and 1907, there were 16 car ferries built for all the various lines uh, on Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, and Lake Michigan. Lake Michigan had the most. Um, and just here in, in Lake Michigan, there were um, 12 car ferries built during that time. And all of these boats had open sterns. Uh, they had no, even though the stern protection had come up during the building of Ann Arbor number one, nothing was provided to cover up the stern against the seas. So in this shot, we see the Ann Arbor number four tipped up in Frankfurt Harbor. You could see the wide open stern here. They're doing some maintenance work on the propellers. And you could, you could see that where her name is on the stern there, how close you are to the level of the lake and uh, how, how there is just really nothing there uh, to protect the stern of the boat from the water coming onto the deck and breaching down into the lower compartments. Uh, this picture actually, they're doing some maintenance work, maintenance work on the propellers. This was pretty common for these early lines to do this work by themselves because these boats were constantly on the move. And if they could do it themselves, they would. So they would just push freight cars up onto the bow of the boat, flood the, bo the bow of the boat with water so the stern would tip up so they could access the propellers and the rudder. More on the Ann Arbor number four later. Here's another shot which shows uh, the freight being loaded all the way to the stern. Now, this is uh, the Pier Marquette 16, uh, a boat that was similar in design to the Ann Arbor's number one and two. It was built by the same people. Uh, <clears throat> actually, these were the third and fourth ferries that were built for Lake Michigan service. Actually, this boat uh, began her service on Lake Erie and then was bought by the Pure Marquette Railroad. Uh, these were made of wood and they were heavy boats. They could take a lot of punishment, which they had to because these boats during storms trying to enter the port were constantly hitting the break walls or hitting the bottom and the boat would flex. And uh, uh, they just, they took a whole lot of punishment and they even though they did the work that they were designed to do, they weren't very successful in the long run because uh, newer and newer technology was coming out. The first steel car ferry was built in 1896 for the Pier Marquette Railroad, basically the same design. Now, these car ferries, the open stern and the car deck design was used for all the boats that were built. So the Ann Arbor number one really is the same design as the SS Badger is today. It has the, the flat car deck, uh, uh, the um, twin screw propellers. Uh, it's basically the same design, except of course the Badger is much more modern and has a lot more capacity for passengers. The early boats were pretty crude. So these ferries ran into a lot of inclement weather, especially during the winter when they were the busiest. Here's the Pier Marquette 17 again, uh, after she had made it into Ludington uh, during a winter storm. Uh, you could see how the stern is all iced up. The, the rear of the freight cars have, they're all iced up you would have to even have a separate crew come in and try and chop the ice off the couplers here to try and even get the freight off the deck. Uh, and once again, you know, the, the open stern is, is right there. And uh, the crew, you know, is, is posing, you know, here for the photographer, but 
But during some of these storms and when the waves were coming up over the, the stern and, and water was coming in to the boiler room and to the engine room, the crews down below were absolutely terrorized by this. I mean, you know, trying to keep these boats moving. So we find out here in an article, March 14th, 1906, this is from the Ludington Chronicle, where they're starting to be more, uh, uh, they're trying to come up with an idea of what to do on this, on this problem. It says Lake Michigan car ferries will be protected. Superintendent Mercero has ordered construction an adjustable shutter back for each of the Pier Marquette car ferries 17 and 18 are already fitted out with contrivances of this kind, which when in place will form a solid wall three feet across the stern of each boat. It is believed that that will prove sufficient to hold the water back in any emergency. The need for additional protection of this kind has never been felt so much as during the past six months when the storms on Lake Michigan have been more than usual severity and the boats have also been carrying bigger and heavier loads, which put them deeper down into the water. During a recent gale, number 20, arrived off Milwaukee when a tremendously heavy sea was running and a thick snowstorm completely obscured the shore from view. Great waves rolled in the vessel's stern, running 10 feet high over the car deck. Tons of water fell through the hatches into the fire hold, and at one time the water was over a foot deep on the floor of the fire room. Three of the nine fires burning under the number 20's boilers were put out by the inrush of water, and the crew of the boat were for a time much concerned as to the final outcome. However, the big ferry rode out the gale safely and arrived in port, none the worse for an exciting experience. I don't think these guys were too excited. I think they're scared. Um, so they recognized the problem. And uh, this happened often, I mean, it wasn't always documented by the newspapers, but this happened more often than not. So, so here's the Pier Marquette 17 with her temporary Seagate fitted, which was supposed to solve the issue. And this is really nothing more than a wood post uh, set in the middle of the stern of the boat with some boards that they've laid across here and they're only like the article says, like three feet high. And then when they would get into port, they lift up the boards and take off the freight, load up and put down the boards and leave again. Now, when the stern was iced up, I don't, really don't know how they got the boards out of that, but, but this is their solution to fight Lake Michigan and to keep their boats safe. Uh, the Ann Arbor was also trying to combat the problem uh, and sometimes what they would do is they just stack railroad ties across the stern of the ship to try and keep the seas out. In the meantime, in Lake Erie, uh, some of the operators had started to make some changes on their boats, uh, which would uh, kind of like show the way uh, towards a more modern type of uh, system to keep the stern closed. The Ashtabula was built in 1906 uh, and she ran from Ashtabula, Ohio to uh, uh, Canada with coal. Most of the time her cargo was just coal. Uh, the uh, uh, Eastern coal from Kentucky and West Virginia and Pennsylvania would be ferried across to Canada for power. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> What you can see here on the stern of the Ashtabula is they have built two doors, two steel doors, hinge doors, you can see the hinges here, that would close about halfway across the stern to try and keep the water out. It wouldn't go all the way across the stern, but it would keep, uh, uh, they'd close about to this point here. So at least they were trying to do something to protect their ships and their crew. Uh, because this is an ongoing issue and these boats, these car ferries were making, you know, each ship was making hundreds of crossings a year and they ran 24-7 uh, and uh, 
So it was hard to get them, you know, into the shipyard for service. So when they did, they had to make sure that they came up with something that, that was worthwhile. You can also see here the, the rail jacks here that are holding the freight into the boat. Now, these jacks uh, were a universal uh, form of restraint to try and, mm -hmm. and stabilize the cargo. Here's another one here. Uh, this jack here weighs about 250 pounds, this piece here. And they would rate, actually, they'd put four of these on a, each corner of the car and it would raise it up just a little bit off the truck so it had no independent motion, but it is. You can see this crew has gotten a little bit more creative and has this jack wedged up against one of the rails here and against the back of the car to also keep it from going back and forth. There's another picture of the Ashtabula a little bit earlier. The Seagate system was fitted around uh, about 1912. There's one of the doors here. Another one here, a car here, which might be full of coal. All this, this might be some kind of scrap material they're carrying around. It's kind of hard to tell. <clears throat> the years 1909 and 1910 were kind of a watershed year for, for the car ferry operations. They had uh, been going for sometime now uh, more new ships had been built uh, just within 1902 and 1903 the Pier Marquette had come out with four new boats um, and they were starting to figure out more and more how these boats reacted what they could do what they couldn't do uh, one of the first major accidents that they ran into was here in Manistique Michigan when the Ann Arbor number no. four, which is here on the left, was improperly loaded with iron ore, which is a very heavy, dense cargo, uh, not really meant for rail car transport on a car ferry. And they learned this the hard way. Uh, <clears throat> improperly loaded, the boat uh, rolled over on her side in May of 1909. Okay. Uh, you can see here on the right hand side is the Ann Arbor number one still with her open stern and the Ann Arbor number three in the background here are both here to assist in the salvage operation and also to pick up some of the freight because uh, and the crew uh, because the boat four was in dire straits on her side in Manistee Carver. She would be raised in June of that year towed back to Frankfurt and then towed to Milwaukee uh, for uh, rebuilding of her sides and general repairs, and then they sent her right back into service. This happened in May of 1909. <clears throat> Here's another picture of that same accident with the wrecking tug favorite uh, hoisting some of the ore cars, one of the ore cars out of her uh, starboard side. Uh, basically what they did is they just uh, un unriveted the plates on her starboard side, uh, brought the favorite in to uh, clear, the, clear the boat, and then they managed to tip her over onto an even keel and pump her out. <clears throat> in December 1909, the Marquette and Bessemer number two, which is a ferry that's similar to the Ann Arbor number no. four, although a little bit bigger, was built about the same time by in the same shipyard. Uh, she was uh, meant to carry coal between Ohio and Canada. Uh, that was basically her only cargo. She'd make one trip a day with 25 loaded cars of coal. Uh, she'd take them to Port Stanley, Ontario and return that night with the empty cars and repeat this trip over and over again. In December 1909, <clears throat> she uh, loaded up with 25 loaded cars of coal, left Conneaut, Ohio, and was never seen again. Uh, she sank with uh, her crew of 40. Uh, wreckage was picked up several days later. Uh, a lifeboat was picked up by a Laker 
and towed back into Conneaut, Ohio with nine frozen bodies in it. Um, they don't know what happened to the boat, but uh, it was during a severe storm and and obviously, or evidently, she was swamped by the heavy seas and, and foundered. Um, this wreck of the Marquette and Bessemer number two has never been located. Although apparently last summer, <clears throat> uh, the diver that found the wreckage of the Pier Marquette 18 also thinks that he has located some wreckage from the number two. He has found two anchors and several coal hoppers on the bottom of Lake Erie. Uh, so that may be another major discovery coming up this summer. Uh, ironically, the number two was scheduled to go into the shipyard during the winter of 1909 and have a Seagate fitted. Now, uh, in 1912, the Grand Trunk ferries, Milwaukee and Grand Haven also had Seagates fitted uh, they were the first two actually to have that work done where they had actually a steel gate fitted across the stern. And so the, the uh, operators of these boats were starting to make some improvements because they had to. In March 1910, uh, the Ann Arbor number one uh, was tied up in Manitowoc, Wisconsin with a full load of freight. Uh, she caught fire and uh, burned to the waterline. Uh, the fire has uh, never positively been identified, but most people think that it started down in the bow of the ship in a, in a paint locker and just spread across the wooden ship um, and consumed the boat. Uh, the boat, uh, Ann Arbor number one had just had quite a bit of work done by the railroad in, uh, in 1908 to 1909 and was considered to be seaworthy. And I don't think the railroad had any real issues with her. I don't think they were planning on getting rid of her anytime soon because they needed, they needed the boats and the fleet to maintain the freight that they were carrying across the lake. In September of 1910, uh, the Pier Marquette 18, which was 350 feet long, steel ship, uh, had full deck of passenger accommodations, was the flagship of the Pier Marquette fleet at the time, uh, was on her way from uh, Ludington to Milwaukee with a full load of freight and quite a number of passengers and crew. Uh, when she was about halfway across the lake from Milwaukee to Lunnington, it was discovered that she was taking on water at an alarming rate and was settling at the stern. <clears throat> the captain of the 18 altered her course and they actually pushed 13 freight cars off the stern into the lake. <laughs> to try and lighten the load on the boat, excuse me. But the ship kept taking on water and the stern kept settling and they were unable to save the ship. Uh, the 18 sank uh, about 25 miles off of Sheboygan, Wisconsin, uh, within sight of the Pier Marquette 17, her sister ship, which you see on the left-hand side of the picture. Uh, the 17 was on her way from Milwaukee to Ludington when she picked up the distress call from the 18 and was close enough to uh, go to the scene and she rescued some of the passengers and crew, although there was still a pretty strong loss of life in this incident. And including all of the officers, the chief engineer, um, and it was a very hard blow to the people of Ludington, you know, all their, their families, their, you know, their husbands worked on these boats. Uh, so this was a very tragic accident at the time. The wreck of the 18 was discovered uh, two years ago in uh, her stern is in 500 feet of water. Her bow is in 400 feet of water <clears throat> and she torpedoed into the lake bottom as she went down stern first. <clears throat> the consensus is, is that they think that she either had some buckled plates uh, in her aft section 
or there were some open portholes down near the water line that had been left open uh, that were leaking in water for quite a long time and nobody had realized it until it was too late. In 1911, after the loss of the Ann Arbor number one in 1910, the Ann Arbor brought out the Ann Arbor number five. Uh, and she arrived in Frankfurt in January, 1911. Uh, she was a big ship, 360 feet long, a great icebreaker. Uh, and she also had the first factory installed Seagate. Now you can see here's the stern gate here and it's raised and lowered by chains that go down to a steam engine, uh, which is down below the water line. Uh, both chains are connected to a single drum on a steam engine, which raises and lowers this gate. Now the gate was only five feet high, but it was a start and uh, uh, the, the number five uh, was the first boat to have this done by the shipyard. Now, in, also in January 1911, the Pier Marquette 18 had built another boat to replace the one that sank, and she was also called Pier Marquette 18. <clears throat> she also came out with a factory installed Seagate. So now you're seeing these new builds are coming out with something finally to protect the stern. Uh, the number five would have a long career in Frankfurt uh, being towed out in 1967. In 1918, the Ann Arbor number six entered Frankfurt. Uh, the number six eventually would be rebuilt into the Arthur K. Atkinson, which I'm sure a lot of you remember. Uh, here is the number six stern two in 1918 with the Ann Arbor number four. Uh, you could see the number six is Seagate here is in the upright position and they're transferring freight from uh, the number two to the number six or vice versa. One of them is stuck in the ice right at the entrance to Frankfurt Harbor. Uh, it's more likely that it's the number four. Uh, here is the uh, Frankfurt light in the background here on the port side, number four. This light would eventually be moved to a new base on the North Breakwater, and we still have it today. We're still lucky to have it today. This was common with these car ferries to go stern two with each other uh, to try and lighten the load. Uh, if these boats got stuck in the ice, uh, they did it quite often. So we are all pretty much familiar with the mural at the post office. We see it every day um, in 1923. And I'm not gonna go too much into it because a lot of us know the stories that the number four left Frankfurt for Kiwani, ran into a storm, um, couldn't make it through the waves, didn't have enough power. Uh, so she had to come about and run with the sea. And this picture was, this painting depicts what happened when she was trying to, when she was pitching into the oncoming seas. What's interesting about this picture is that it shows the wooden sea gate, which had been installed at the stern of the ship. This is pretty accurate right here. they were like a pair of swinging doors, which you swing open and then they swing, swing them across the stern. But they didn't really provide any protection especially not in this type of a situation. Uh, the, the four was able to make her turn. Uh, she made it back to Frankfurt and sank in, and you know, at the breakwater, uh, 15 minutes more out in the lake and she probably wouldn't have been as lucky. Uh, it's, she's really the only car ferry that was involved in a situation like this that didn't sink. And a lot of it was, was really just luck. Here's an interior shot of the number four with some of the crew. Uh, the man sitting here was the chief engineer on the boat uh, and he served on several Ann Arbor boats at the time. Uh, he's sitting in the hatch that goes down in 
into either the coal bunker or the engine room. Uh, you could see the damage to the interior of the ship caused by the freight, which had come loose. And during the rolling, when she was trying to make that turn, you could see chunks of coal on the deck because most of her cargo was coal. Uh, the crew opened the bottom of some of the coal hoppers and let the cargo out onto the car deck to keep the freight from, from rolling and pitching around on the deck. And it actually might have saved the ship. Also, there were two coal hoppers that that went over the stern of the number four and hung there, uh, which also probably prevented some of the more severe waves to come in over the, the stern of the boat, which probably helped her right out the storm as well. Another picture on the inside of the number four showing a coal hopper tipped against the inner stanchions of the ship. Uh, you know, the, these compromise the upper decks, the steam connections, uh, <clears throat> making the ship unstable. The number four uh, was raised in uh, refloated in May of 1923 and taken over to Manitowoc Shipbuilding and, and rebuilt to an extent. Uh, they gave her a new pilot house, a new stack, uh, some new crew quarters above the uh, car deck, above on the spar deck now, and they weren't below the car deck. <clears throat> but what's interesting with this picture is that she came back from the shipyard with no Seagate. And uh, this is one of the uh, causes of, of her sinking and some other boats that came into grief too. She still has her wooden doors, her swinging doors, uh, when this was taken. Uh, uh, the number four didn't have uh, much of a career left with the Ann Arbor, though, as uh, the newer boats were being introduced. And she was still small and underpowered and didn't have the capacity of the other boats. Uh, she was laid up for most of the 1930s during the Depression. Uh, she was towed out. Uh, of Frankfurt in 1937 by Michigan State Ferries, which put her into operation carrying automobiles in between Mackinac City and St. Ignace before the Mackinac Bridge was built. And she had a very successful career doing that. And she was not scrapped until 1974. Here's a picture of the number four and the number three at the same time taken during the winter of 1925 by noted photographer of the area, William Sharp, who documented a lot of these great images that we see of Frankfurt, and Bristol Lake, and uh, the car ferries. Uh, uh, his legacy is, is a very rich one with the images that he took around town. Uh, you could see, see the three and the four still have their wooden Seagates there. Uh, they would not receive a retrofitted Seagate until about 1930. This is the number six is on the left with the number five in the middle. And what's going on in this picture is the number five is going to lead the other three ferries out through this ice field that you see here, which has totally blocked the harbor entrance. And the ice there likely goes uh, in some cases all the way to the bottom of the, the channel. So what the accident of the number four did in 1923, it, it accomplished basically two things. First of all, it decided the Pier Marquette Railroad decided that they had had enough and they went to Manitowoc Shipbuilding and they said, we want you to design a stern gate that we can retrofit on our boats and we want you to do it in a hurry because they already had two new ferries under contract with Manitowoc and uh, uh, the, the first one would come out in 1924 and the second one in 1925. These are the first two boats in the class of the city of Milwaukee that were built, the Pier Marquette 21 and 22. But this is the plan of the Seagate that was retrofitted onto their other four car ferries that, that were in service at the time. Um, it wasn't very big, it was five feet tall, uh, but you can see the design, how it's raised up by chains by the engine that's below the car deck, the steam engine. Another thing that the sinking of the Ann Arbor number four did was it 
it, uh, it really pushed ahead the construction of the Arrowhead breakwater that we have in Frankfurt now, because uh, during any kind of westerly weather, uh, these ferries well, were having a very hard time trying to make the harbor through the narrow entrance just by the, the two narrow break walls. So uh, it was decided then after the, the number four sank that they really needed to protect the harbor better. And it wouldn't be built, it wouldn't be completed for another eight or nine years, but they were on their way after this, this, uh, this episode. Uh, R.H. Reynolds, who was superintendent of the Ann Arbor at the time, actually was uh, involved with a group of Great Lakes shippers that had, uh, that was blaming the historically low level of Lake Michigan at the time in 1923. He blamed the low level of the lake for uh, the severe damage that the number four had when she hit the bottom coming into the harbor. Uh, and they blamed this on the reversal of the Chicago River, which they believed was draining the water out of Lake Michigan. And they were very firm in this belief and really were, at the time, were trying to get something done about it with the city of Chicago. So, so they're starting to put sea gates on these boats. Um, and uh, the, the documented accidents, uh, there weren't any more major, you know, uh, like founderings or anything like that, but the boats still were running in, in kind of in heavy weather all times, you know, during the year, they ran all year. The Milwaukee here shown here is 340 feet long. Well powered with 3000 horsepower. Uh, full deck of passenger cabins. She was a, a well-built ship. And uh, she, she left uh, uh, Grand Haven for Milwaukee on October 22nd, ran over to Milwaukee in a heavy storm. Uh, but her captain, Captain Robert McKay, said that it wasn't anything that he hadn't seen before. And he went and backed into his slip on the Kinnikinnick River and started to unload and, and reload for his trip back. Now, uh, at the time it was written that he had a reputation of taking his boat out in any weather and uh, because he just thought he could beat anything. Um, and his family over the years has, has uh, disputed that. They say that he was only six months away from retirement, so why would he take his boat out in a storm like this? Uh, the captain of the Car Ferry Madison, which is another Grand Trunk boat, which was in Milwaukee at the time the Milwaukee came in, uh, told him that he didn't think he should go out into the storm, which was still intensifying at the time when he left at 3 p.m. that afternoon. Um, There's speculation that the Grand Trunk uh, ordered him to sail, uh, but we'll never know that. Uh, the Grand Trunk had a reputation for not being as cautious as some of the other Lake Michigan lines. At any rate, the, the Milwaukee left the harbor at three, uh, three that afternoon, minus two of her crewmen who had gone into Milwaukee to watch a movie because they didn't think the boat was going to leave. Um, so she sails out in the storm passes the light ship that's off Milwaukee Harbor. The light ship reports that she's having great difficulty in the seas. Uh, she makes it a certain distance out into Lake Michigan. The captain figures out that he's not gonna make it. He has to change course. It's, he headed north uh, into the seas uh, and was unable to uh, keep that course. So he had to turn before the seas and uh, the boat was, was swamped by the waves. Now, going back to what I said originally, some of these early car ferries had no protection over their gratings that go down to the car, car deck. This picture is on the wreck of the Milwaukee. <clears throat> the wheels of a freight car sitting on one of the grates over the, the uh, coal bunkers. <coughs> you can see that the hatch there is just an open grating. And it's, it's likely that uh, 
the lake damaged the Milwaukee Seagate, which had been retrofitted in 1912 to the point where it was useless and the waves were just coming up onto the car deck and they swamped the ship. Now, uh, at the time it was thought that some of the freight had gotten loose and rolled off the stern of the ship, taking the Seagate with it. Uh, but we'll see in a minute that the Seagate is still attached to the ship. And the Wisconsin Historical Society recently did an archeological survey of the wreck and all 26 cars are still on board. Here's a diver coming out of one of the coal bunker hatches. And you can see the wheels of the freight car right above uh, where they dropped the coal by gravity right into the hold of the boat. You can see part of the wooden grate here or the steel grate here, there was no cover over it. Also the door that went down into the uh, cruise quarters below uh, the car deck was found to be unsecured. Uh, and uh, when they did a survey of the wreck. Uh, so there are a lot of things uh, that should have been done here that were not, <clears throat> that contributed to the sinking of the boat. So here's the Milwaukee today, sitting on the bottom of the lake. Uh, what you see there in the stern is what remains of her Seagate. Uh, the Seagate still attached to the ship. Uh, you could see her two propellers right here. You can see the rails coming onto the stern here. And the Seagate is this bend here was caused by the heavy seas. And it bent the Seagate inward and couldn't keep the water out. Uh, there are two freight cars that are uh, laid at angles the two closest cars to the stern are laid at angles to the stern and it's speculated that after this happened, the crew managed to turn the cars across the stern to try and keep the water out, but it was too late. Uh, you, so the boat was settling all the time and after the purser wrote that note and threw it overboard, uh, the boat, probably stayed afloat for about another hour before she went down. Uh, there were two lifeboats recovered from the Milwaukee. One had four men in it. Uh, the other one was found just floating around. Um, but it was, it was a very tragic accident that could have been prevented. And she was only 15 minutes out of, outside of Milwaukee Harbor in, in good sailing weather. And it, it, it appears that the captain really would, had turned around and he was trying to make it back to port, but he just ran out of time. So that is the end of uh, this part of the program, because there are other parts to this program, which I have. So uh, does anybody have any questions or comments? Dan, this is Larry. I think we, um, if you could read, um, return the host to me, I will okay. open up questions. <clears throat> I have a question, Marcia Curran here. My, um, my grandfather was Ralph Henry Reynolds, uh, who was in charge of the car ferries out of Frankfurt for a number of years. Um, I wonder, he, he was in charge of the construction of the number seven, and um, you didn't mention that. I don't know if it had a different kind of gate on the back or not. I would be interested to know that. Hi, Marsha, this is Tim. Uh, I appreciate the uh, materials you brought into the museum. They're very interesting. Uh, thank you for bringing them in. You're welcome. Uh, the Ann Arbor number no. seven was one of uh, what they call the Manitowoc six. Uh, the, the drawings that I presented at the beginning of the program were of the city of Milwaukee. Uh, Manitowoc Shipbuilding came up with a standard design of, of a car ferry that uh, was built for all three Lake Michigan lines. Uh, the Pier Marquette had two, the Grand Trunk Railroad had three, and uh, the Ann Arbor had one, which is the Ann Arbor number seven, which is what you're asking about. 
Um, she had uh, one of the standard Seagates that they were installing in the boat at the time. And also one thing I kind of glossed over is that after the loss of the Milwaukee, uh, uh, the, uh, the inspection service mandated that the height of the Seagate be raised to eight feet, six inches. And so all the boats had to go back to the shipyard and they had more steel put on top of the Seagate to raise it up to that level. Uh, the city of Midland and the Spartan and the Badger, their sea gates are 10 feet tall uh, and weigh, weigh about 13,000 pounds. Uh, so they were much more sturdily constructed than the early boats. But the number seven, to answer your question, just had a standard sea gate at the time. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Larry, it's Ned Edwards. I would like to ask uh, Tim about how the boats dealt with the ice in the winter. I know that there were some um, on the Milwaukee, um, uh, you can see today, there were some kind of steam pipes that went along the sides of the bow to try to keep the ice uh, melted a bit. Uh, were there any other ways that they dealt with the heavy weight of the ice on the actual hull of the ship? Uh, the ice, depending on the thickness, uh, the, the wooden boats, the early wooden boats often would be frozen in and they would actually, uh, the ice could actually squeeze the hull and then release it at times. The steel boats did not have that issue. What they did have an issue with was uh, how do you bring water into the boilers if you're drawing it out of the lake and the level of the ice goes below the bottom of the boat where you, you, know, you couldn't bring any fresh water. Uh, most of these ferries had uh, on their intakes, their boiler intakes would have a small steam fitting uh, that would keep the water that they drew in in a liquid form so they could draw it out of the ice so they could keep running. Uh, they also tried to dynamite the ice at times, which was never a success. It caused more damage to the boat than, than it did anything else because the chunks of ice would fly up in the air and come down on the cabins. Um, sometimes they just got stuck, you know, uh, sometimes they'd have to call on the Coast Guard like they did in 19, I believe it was 1977 with the Viking. They'd have to call on the Coast Guard and, and have their icebreakers trying to get, get them unstuck. And even then their icebreakers would get stuck. So, but as a rule, car ferries were good icebreakers. They weren't very long ships. They had a lot of power behind them. And especially the Ann Arbor boats had a specially constructed bow that was designed to raise up on the ice with the momentum of the ship. And then the weight of the boat would crush the ice around it. Does that help? Yes, appreciate that. Great. Tim, there's a couple of questions in the chat line here. Um, one was how did they get the rails to align when transferring rail cars from one ferry to another in rough seas? They wouldn't try and pull that off in a rough seas. They could only do that on a calm sea or in the ice. Uh, and the rail track pattern for all of the Lake Michigan car ferries was the same. So they were able to uh, go stern to and match up the rails. Uh, uh, they all use the same unloading platforms. Uh, it, was, it was done to a standard design. Great. The second question was, um, why did it take so long for the retrofits um, that it you know, have taken up to 20 years before they really realized that they had the design flaw? That's a great question. And it's always been speculated that some of these car ferry lines did it on the cheap, okay? Especially the Grand Trunk Railroad was notorious for not doing the upgrades on their boats when maybe they should have. Uh, it's, it's a tough question to answer because they did recognize the problem. Um, they tried various ways to get around it and none of it really worked. Uh, the Seagates, even after they were installed, 
even uh, after they were raised, they were not uh, a fail safe option to keep the boat safe. The Hello? last documented case of Seagate damage that I'm aware of came in 1975 and that was on the Spartan. Um, I, I know a lot of you have been on the Badger as big as she is, the Spartan is her sister ship she was oh, caught in let me look. waves. If that, uh, that would be the Spartan great. was driven backwards into oh. the waves. Uh, and her Seagate. Well, you know, the waves uh, dented the top of the Seagate in. So uh, this was not a fail safe uh, uh, solution by any means. It was meant to keep the water out and keep the freight in, but it was not uh, the be all end all. John? I, I found it interesting that um, the, it's a fantastic presentation, Tim. Um, you never use the word pumps in the course of this. And I just kind of fascinated and these ships had very substantial power. Uh, but it's interesting that as here's a situation in which water is accumulating in the bottom of the hull. Uh, and I'm fascinated that pumps were not more successful apparently in being able to re to uh, guard against the peril of uh, that they faced. John, you've been on the city of Milwaukee. You've oh, been yeah. out in the engine room. Yeah. You know probably where her bilge pump is. <laughs> and you also know that when you're down in the engine room on the city of Milwaukee, you're about five feet from the bottom of the ship. So you have one bilge pump to pump out a substantial volume of water uh, that if you're in that situation where water is coming up through your engine room plates and up to the height of the firebox on the boilers, I don't think one pump is sufficient. So it was, it was up to the chief engineer to decide when to start the pumps because the stump, the pumps also ran on steam pressure. Yeah. So, so he'd have to make the call on when to use the pumps, if it was a danger to the boat. And if, if debris got caught in the, the strainer at the bottom of the pump or something like that, which is, which happened, uh, they could have a real problem. Um, I have always kind of wondered why the early boats didn't have two bilge pumps. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but they also were very uh, liberal in letting water into the bottom of the ship if they needed to trim it out too. So they, were, they could pump water into the bottom of the ship and pump it out when they needed to. It was pumping it out when they had to was the issue. No, I, I agree with you. And steam pressure was the key here. If you, if you lost steam pressure, pressure uh, all you, the machinery on your boat doesn't work. These boats are all mechanical. They're not electronic. They, uh, they run by, by fire and steam and coal. And if the coal gets wet, then you can't, you can't burn it. So there are, there are a lot of variables here that, that contributed to uh, the the accidents that they ran into from a very very early on, even in as early as eight January of eighteen ninety three, they were having trouble with with uh, the boats in storms. They didn't have enough power. They didn't know where they were. You know, they'd run aground and they'd drag them off the beach, and the stern would go into the lake, and the water would come rushing up over the stern just by pulling the boat off the beach. So it's particularly interesting that there didn't seem to be a greater uh, focus on the question of adequacy of pumps, because as you would know, if you go back to earlier ships, uh, to the schooners and so forth, who got it, when they were in trouble, uh, one of the first uh, resorts that were were taken was to get pumps on board those vessels, and uh, uh, you know the. Lifesavers brought pumps, all kinds of uh, efforts were made. T uh, when tugs were, came, they brought pumps. So pumps were very much on the mind, it seems to me, of those who were focusing on uh, safety of these ships. And I'm just sort of fascinated that 
greater attention seems not to have been paid. And you wonder if it was a cost issue to equipping them uh, with uh, pumps that would be adequate to confronting some of the circumstances that they did. It might have been a design issue because of space. You know, you don't know if, if they had enough space in the bilge to add Could the extra be. equipment. I really don't know. I mean, Could be. It's in, a, on the city of Milwaukee, question. you'd have to relocate another bilge pump on the other side of the boat somewhere. Yeah. Well, if there are no other yeah. questions, David, yeah, I've got a question. One more time. Go ahead. I've got a question. Uh, sure. This is David Belknap. Uh, Great, Jim. Nice presentation. Um, thanks for sharing it with us. One of the stories that I heard about the Ann Arbor boats during storms, um, when they could not get into the narrow channel before the Arrowhead uh, breakwater, was that they would go up to um, the Manitou Passage, if they could, and hide behind the uh, islands, uh, the South Manitou Island in that deep uh, uh, bay on the southeast side and you know just nose up into the shore do you know anything about that sure and that wasn't just unique to car ferries uh, uh many great lakes vessels did that uh uh the illinois the passenger steamer illinois which used to be a frequent caller in frankfurt uh got caught in the 1913 storm um and she went up to South Manitou and managed to make it into the lee side of the island and she tied herself to a tree and uh, was there for many hours with the engines running full or, or slow ahead to keep her on the beach and she was tied to a tree. Uh, yes, car ferries did that and uh, other, other steamers and John, I imagine schooners would, would do that too if they oh. had the uh, opportunity. Absolutely. That's really the only place to hide on the West shore of Lake Michigan. Uh, there's nothing. Once you start to cross the lake, you have to go to the other side. There's not really any place to, to duck into. Well, I think it's time. Uh, thank you, Tim. Excellent presentation. Thank you all participants. Great questions. Um, looking forward to everyone joining again. Um, next month, we're going to talk um, again about car ferries. So looking forward to um, everyone joining. Take Thank care. You. Thanks, everybody. Thank you Hope you enjoyed Thank it. You. Thank you much. <laughs>